If you're in the market for an RTX 3090 Ti, I think it is safe to say you are doing pretty well for yourself. So why settle for an air-cooled card? That's what Gigabyte is thinking at least, as today we are checking out the Aorus RTX 3090 Ti Extreme Water Force, complete with a 360mm all-in-one liquid cooler. Alright guys, Dominic here for KitGuru and today we are reviewing the Gigabyte Aorus RTX 3090 Ti Extreme Water Force. This is Gigabyte's absolute top tier graphics card, complete with a 360mm all-in-one liquid cooler, 480 watt power target and of course a factory overclock. All of that does not come cheap however as the Extreme Water Force is currently up for pre-order at a penny under £2,100 here in the UK. So what exactly do you get for your money and is it any good? If we kick off with a look at the card's design and the cooler setup then, I think it's safe to say the overall look is pretty stealthy. Everything is entirely black with just some gold accents in the form of the Aorus logo. The card shroud is made out of plastic but there is one brushed metal section but there is also a full length metal backplate too, which is always good to see. I do have to say however that the actual build quality of this card in the hand doesn't feel super premium as some of the plastic does feel just a little bit creaky. It's obviously not going to be the end of the world as once the card is installed in your system you're never going to touch it. But then again, considering the asking price of £2,100, I personally would have loved to see an all aluminium shroud. It is good to see that the card itself isn't that big however as it's just a standard dual slot thickness while it measures 238mm long and 141mm tall. That being said we obviously do have to factor in not only the 360mm radiator and also the 460mm long tubes so as always it is definitely worth checking this will actually fit in your case. In actual fact, as you are going to see from some of the B-roll, the only way that I could get this radiator installed in the MSI Velox 100p airflow case is to mount it on the outside of the front panel. I've already got a 360mm all-in-one liquid cooler for the CPU which is installed in the roof, so this is the only way I could actually get it to fit, but it did get the job done. As for the all-in-one liquid cooler itself, I have reached out to Gigabyte and asked who the OEM is for this particular unit, but we are yet to hear back. So if we do get confirmation, I will leave a note down in the comments. I was able to reach out to KitGuru's resident modder and reviewer James Dawson, and he reckons the radiator design is similar to what Cooler Master do, so it's possibly a Cooler Master design, but that's just an educated guess right now. What we do know, however, is that Gigabyte is using a single copper base plate to contact both the GPU, the VRM, and the memory with all the heat pulled away thanks to that liquid cooler, so there's no secondary fan on the card itself. Speaking of fans, we of course have to touch on the three 120mm radiator fans used here. These particular ones are manufactured by PowerLogic, and they do seem fine, but I'm just not too keen on the fact that they actually use proprietary fan connectors. You could still swap out these fans for other models and then just connect them to your motherboard, but Gigabyte is using 4-pin connectors anyway, so I just can't see any reason why they wouldn't just use standard 4-pin PWM headers. On that topic as well, I do have to say that the fan cable looks pretty naff running on the outside of the sleeve tubing. Personally, I'd have loved to see this cable tucked inside one of the tubes or at the very least give it a braided sleeving as to me right now it kind of just ruins a little bit of the aesthetic and feels a touch lazy, especially considering the price point. The only other thing to mention on the topic of the fans is that by default they are screwed to the underside or the tube side of the radiator. So that at least suggests that Gigabyte intends for this liquid cooler to be installed on the roof of your chassis with the fans exhausting air out the top. But you can of course flip them over and have them intaking at the front of your chassis like I did. 
Back to the card itself though, we can note another 16 pin PCIe Gen 5 power connector, but I am using the included adapter with three 8 pin connectors, which is quite a lot of cabling in one case, but it gets the job done. We can also see three DisplayPort 1.4 and then one HDMI 2.1 video outputs. That's really it for the design of the card then, and while it certainly is fine, I have to say I do feel a bit underwhelmed considering the price point. There's no dual BIOS for instance, which I personally think is a big omission for any RTX 3090 Ti, and there's also no RGB lighting either, something I find particularly odd considering that the RTX 3090 non-Ti Extreme World Force had plenty of RGB lighting and even RGB radiator fans. To me, this just feels like a backwards step, but if you're an RGB heathen, for instance, you will probably prefer this. Still, I can't help but feel if you're going to be spending over £2,000 on a liquid-cooled GPU, you probably want to make a statement with your graphics card, and to me, this design just feels a little bit plain. I also think the included bundle and accessories is a bit disappointing, again for the price point I was hoping for maybe a GPU support bracket or a screwdriver set like I got with the Sapphire Toxic liquid cooled card, and instead all we get is a Batman style Aorus action figure. Let's leave that behind us though as we're now going to move on to talk about performance. All of our testing was done on our regular GPU test system, which is powered by MSI. This is built around Intel's i9-12900K CPU, plugged into MSI's Z690 Unify motherboard, and we also have 32GB of a Data XPG Lancer DDR5 memory clocked at 6000MHz. Kicking off with the thermal testing then, even with a 480W power limit, I was hoping that the Aorus Extreme Water Force would run cool thanks to its 360mm all-in-one liquid cooler, and I have to say I was pretty happy with the results. We can see a peak GPU temperature of 58 degrees Celsius, easily making this the coolest running RTX 3090 Ti we have tested so far. That being said though, the memory thermals aren't actually as impressive. Now, don't get me wrong, a 78 degree peak temperature for G6X memory is still good, but it's actually higher than the likes of the MSI Supreme X or the Palette GameRock. And I do wonder if that's down to Gigabyte's decision to use a single copper base plate that contacts the GPU, the VRAM, and the memory. Thankfully though, the Extreme Water Force is nice and quiet, hitting just 37 decibels on our sound meter. That was with the fans spinning at 39% or 1115 RPM, and to my ear, there was no audible pump whining either. I did also test noise normalized thermals at 40 decibels, and as expected, the Extreme Water Force is still comfortably the coolest running 3090 Ti, this time with a GPU temperature of 55 degrees and a hotspot of 69 degrees. The memory is still hotter than the other two cards however, which is a bit disappointing, but it has at least dropped down to 76 degrees. Moving on though to look at graphics card only power draw. The Extreme Water Force has a 480 watt power target, and it delivers pretty much bang on that target when testing in Cyberpunk, so that actually means it is slightly more efficient than the MSI Supreme X. Total system power draw, however, is still just shy of 700 watts. So, as with any 3090 Ti, you are going to want a very solid PSU. It's also worth taking a look at the operating clock speeds, where the Extreme Water Force proved the fastest running 3090 Ti we have tested, with an average core frequency of exactly 2115 MHz. That gives it a 60 MHz lead over the MSI Supreme X, and a 105 MHz advantage over the Palette GameRock OC. As to how much difference that actually makes in games, the answer is not a lot. Comparing the Extreme Water Force against the MSI Supreme X, we only saw an average difference of 2% in favour of the Aorus card, and it was 3% faster at the very most. 
Realistically, I just don't think you notice the difference in frame rates when actually playing games. But technically, on paper, the Aorus Extreme is the fastest 3090 Ti we have tested so far. Of course, we did also try and make it even faster with some manual overclocking. Here, we were able to add another 80 MHz to the GPU and 1100 MHz to the memory. Interestingly, that memory overclock isn't actually quite as good as what we managed with the MSI Supreme X, as that could handle an extra 1270 MHz to the memory, though of course this does vary from sample to sample. That GPU overclock, however, saw our average clock speeds increase up to 2189 MHz, which is about 40 MHz faster than the MSI Supreme X. Our frame rates only increased by 2-5%, however, as the Extreme Water Force is already running pretty close to its limits out of the box, so overclocking didn't result in big gains. Overall then, if you're in the market for a liquid-cooled RTX 3090 Ti, the Aorus Extreme Water Force is not a bad buy. It runs basically as fast as any RTX 3090 Ti can run, the GPU stays nice and cool, and the radiator fans are also nice and quiet, so in terms of the day-to-day -day operation of the card, it is very successful. The thing is though, I just can't help but feel that Gigabyte could have given us a bit more. I mean, aside from the fact that it's using an all-in-one liquid cooler, I'm just not sure how extreme this card really is. Take the lack of dual BIOS for instance, this to me is a really odd omission as surely anyone buying a liquid cooled 3090 Ti is going to want to push things to their absolute limit, so having a dual BIOS seems like a no brainer to me. I also find the omission of any RGB lighting a bit strange, particularly considering that all the other Water Force cards come completely blinged out. Factor in the memory thermals, which are fine but not that impressive, and the fact that the build quality of the shroud didn't leave me blown away, and I would say that Gigabyte needs to do a bit more for this card to live up to its extreme name tag. After all, the pricing is certainly extreme, at a penny under £2,100. That is going to do it for this review though guys, so if you liked it, please do toss me a thumbs up, and as always, let me know your thoughts down in the comments. You can also subscribe and ding that notification bell if you haven't already, and why not come chat with us on our Discord server, which is linked in the description. While you're there, you can also find a link to our merch store, and if you're feeling particularly generous, you could even consider backing us on Patreon. That is it for this one though guys, I'm Dominic for Kit Guru, and I'll see you in the next video.